The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody, uh, and hello, and thank you for joining this webinar, this morning's webinar on logic models. Uh, my name is Gareth Davis. I'm the Our Place Program Officer, and uh, I think I might have spoken to some of you. I might have met some of you at the recent event in London. Um, and for those of you who did attend the recent events, it's good to speak to you again. And for those of you that couldn't uh, attend any of the um, events, welcome to Our Place 2015-16. Uh, my role today is to help facilitate, facilitate the, the webinar on uh, the Our Place Logic model. And I will shortly be handing you over to David Morris uh, from New Economy Manchester, who will be ta uh, talking you through all things logic model. Uh, as you should already be aware, the submission of a logic model is the first key milestone in this year's program. Uh, and besides the operational plan, it's the only other key deliverable. Uh, one of the key lessons we learned from last year's program is that an area's logic model is really a real critical element in the development of your operational plan as it provides you with the opportunity to energize and rally support for a proposal uh, by de precisely declaring what, an air, what, what you are trying to accomplish in your area that will be achieved through the logic model. Uh, it will also help the our place it, it, so it will also help our place team and DCLG determine whether or not your area will be request, required to develop a cost-benefit analysis later in the year. Anyway, before I hand over to David, um, I just wanted to go through some housekeeping, uh, housekeeping arrangements. Uh, the presentation that you see on the screen today will be emailed to you after the event so that you can take a look at them again. Uh, during the presentation, we'll be running a couple of polls. This is a chance for you to provide some feedback. Uh, when we run the polls, you'll see a blue box appear on your screen, and all you need to do is select the option that relates to you and click on, click on it with your mouse. Uh, we'll also ha be having some question and answer se sessions throughout the presentation. And if you look on the right-hand side of your screen, you will see there is a control panel in the bottom half of that panel. Um, there's a control panel in the bottom half of that panel uh, is an area for you to type your questions and I'll be writing them down and I'll be reading them out at the appropriate time and any questions that we don't get a chance to answer today or can't answer immediately we will be addressed well will be addressed outside the session and we'll get back to you during the next week okay so I'll now hand over, over oh, hand you over to David for the first part of the presentation thank you Gareth and hello everybody um, as Gareth mentioned, um, I may have met some of you at the York induction event uh, a few weeks back, so hello again to those of you who I did meet there. Um, others of you may have met uh, Sue Holloway and the team from Pro Bono Economics at the London in induction event, which followed shortly after that one. Um, both those events gave a, a pretty quick run-through of logic models and cost-benefit analysis. Um, and the purpose of today's webinar is to take a bit more time and to go into a bit more depth um, exactly what a logic model is and how over the next month you should go about completing a logic model for your R place proposal. Um, don't worry if you weren't able to attend what the York or the London induction events. Um, today's session will give you uh, at the outset um, a description of logic models, an idea of what they actually are and what they look like. And then we'll all go through, um, using a worked example, um, populating a logic model. Um, for those of you who did go to the York or London events, um, please do stay on the line uh, because, firstly, this will be a, a more in-depth discussion of logic models. Um, and secondly, um, we look at a different worked example so at the York event, I looked at an example from, from North London around jobs and employment, whereas today we'll look at uh, an R-Place Pioneer area that's based in Tower Hamlets in East London. Uh, and as you'll see, they are more focused on, on health outcomes. So hopefully you'll be able to compare and contrast today's worked example to the worked examples you heard about at the York or, or London events. In terms of the structure of the next 90 minutes or so, um, I'm going to start by um, explaining the logic model template. So a slide shows you exactly which template the R Place program requires you to, to fill in. Um, and we'll take a fair bit of time going through each section of the template in turn 
um, to understand what you need to put in each bit of your logic model. I'll then introduce the Tower Hamlets example project that I just referred to. So we'll take a bit of time to understand the issues they face in that area and the response they have generated through uh, their uh, our place proposal. Um, we'll then apply that uh, Tower Hamlets example to the logic model template. Uh, so we'll go step by step through the template, putting in information that is relevant to the Tower Hamlets example. And then towards the end of the uh, webinar, I'll just give you a few firstly tips for completing your own logic models. So things to think about as you go through that process over the next four weeks. Um, and secondly, uh, uh, some information on how producing a good logic model at this stage will help those areas that need to do a cost-benefit analysis um, to complete that process easily and simply. Um, if you have a, a good logic model in place, um, it makes cost-benefit analysis, as we'll see, so much easier. Okay, before we move on to, to looking at the logic model template that the R-Place program uses, I just want to start off with a, a poll question um, to gauge the level of understanding and knowledge of logic models amongst the audience. So the question I'm putting to you is then, nice and simple, what knowledge do you have of logic models? And Gareth will be opening that poll, so you should be able to yeah, vote. It should be open yeah. now. You should be able to vote. OK. Thank you, Gareth. OK, we'll give you some time to give your answers. There's a, a fair few of you on the call, so I'll leave this open a little bit longer. Okay, are you? Yep, Gareth, can you see how many people have, have voted so far? Because I don't uh, have that control on my panel, if you could just let me know. Yeah, I think 94% of the of uh, attendees have right. voted. That's, that's really good then. So if you could uh, close the poll and, and launch the results so we can have a yeah. look at uh, what people are saying. Um, Thank you very much for, for those of you who have voted. There you go, that's the... Uh, okay. Those are the results. So results are coming through. So quite a lot of you looking at, at my screen then. So you've heard of a logic model, but that's about it. Um, and some of you saying you have some limited knowledge. So you might have uh, looked at logic models at other uh, programs or come across slightly different looking logic models. OK. So well, all of you obviously have heard of one, but that's about it. Um, today, I, hope I aim to take your, your knowledge up towards the other end of, of the whole spectrum, uh, and you hopefully by the end of it we'll say you're knowledgeable about what a logic model is, uh, what parts it contains, um, and how you go about completing one. Um, as I say, there'll be a poll question at the end where we can uh, judge whether I've achieved my objective or not. So thank you very much, Gareth. If you could hide those results for us, go back to my screen. There we go. Right then, so first part of the webinar, I'm going to talk you through uh, the logic model template that the R-Place program uses uh, and requires all proposals to, to complete. And the logic model in front of you, um, this is set out in a circular fashion. So we start in the top left-hand corner in this box entitled Conditions. We then flow down to the bottom left-hand cor corner following the arrows to the boxes which describe the details of the activity uh, and the resources that are funding your, your proposals. And then we flow over to the right and then finally up to the top right hand corner where we think about if we deliver those activities over a period of time, what outcomes will we deliver for our residents in terms of improvement in their lives or perhaps not residents, you might consider them clients or however you term them. And if our residents or clients achieve those outcomes, what impact will that have in wider society, within the wider economy um, that our, our area is located? So it's flowing from top left all the way around to, to top right. Um, some of you may have come across logic models which are set out in different ways. Um, there are lots of different examples out there. Um, some logic models flow horizontally from left to right. 
um, others flow vertically from, from top to bottom. It doesn't matter um, what type of logic model you're looking at, um, because all logic models um, have essentially the same parts to them. So they always have a, a section which describes the context for local conditions. So if you like, that is the space in the logic model where you show what is wrong. So, so what is going wrong within a community, within an economy, within a, a neighbourhood, um, which requires some kind of response from the public, the voluntary, from, from other parties. So that part of the logic model tells you what is wrong. Then all logic models, regardless of layout, will have um, boxes sort of with the titles that we see in the bottom left-hand corner of this example. And this is where we explain the steps that are going to be taken to correct what is wrong. So how much money and manpower is going to be invested, uh, doing what, um, to whose benefit, um, and over what time scale. So that's where we describe that the nuts and bolts of a program, if you like, as I often call it. And then finally, in all logic models, you get to these two boxes on the right-hand side, outcomes and impacts. And this is describing um, the, if those activities that we've just set out are successful, what outcomes and impacts will result. So those are the three questions a logic model always answers, regardless, regardless of its format. Um, you'll see in this example that the R-Place program uses, um, what we're describing here really is a virtuous circle. So we're starting by describing what is wrong. And then we're moving around to say, OK, we're going to do this in response. And that should lead to these kind of outcomes, which mean that the original conditions we were faced, whether that's um, high levels of poor health amongst your, your resident group, or high, late, high rates of youth unemployment, and if we're successful, those original contextual factors will have been removed. Um, and it will remove the need for future intervention, for future expenditure on this kind of activity. So we're describing it a virtuous circle um, through our activities. Before we go on to, to think about how we might populate a logic model, I just want to spend a bit more time talking you through what needs to go in each box, because I realize there are lots of boxes here to, to get your heads around. Um, at this point, I want to make reference to uh, the online guide that explains how you should complete a logic model. Um, this is available through the uh, My Community Rights Our Place website that you should all have um, had links to and you should all be aware of. Um, in the resources section of that website, there is a, uh, um, a downloadable guide which explains where it introduces logic models and it explains in more detail what each of these boxes um, is related to. And I will just now uh, read from that uh, to give you a bit more information on each of the boxes. So starting then in the top left-hand corner, looking at conditions. So in this part of the logic model, we need to do three things. Firstly, we need to provide evidence of the issues, the challenges within your local area. And when we talk about evidence, we're not just talking about qualitative evidence. So you might have done some research locally with, uh, with local residents or you might have talked um, with local partners, such as um, healthcare providers, um, and got some qualitative, some verbal feedback on what people think are key challenges. What you also need to put in this box is statistics, so numerical data, uh, percentages, things which demonstrate um, the scale of a problem within your area. So if you're focusing on um, getting long-term out-of-work residents back into employment, I'd expect to see stuff here around the unemployment rate within your neighbourhood or within your borough. Uh, I'd also expect to see that um, presented with, with trends over time. So is the unemployment issue locally getting worse? And therefore, there's a real case for intervention. Likewise, is the unemployment rate locally considerably higher than in neighbouring areas? I.e., if we were only going to do this our place activity in one part of a locality, we should do it in this neighbourhood because this neighbourhood faces the greatest challenges. So you need to be accessing uh, data such as Office of National Statistics data. Um, you need to be thinking about, does my local authority, does my clinical commissioning group, does my NHS trust, do they have data um, that they can share with me, which shows that the extent of the problem locally. 
and then combining that, if you have it, with perhaps verbal feedback from residents, from clients, from partner agencies. So that's one thing you need in this box. You also need to, to briefly summarize the local and national policies um, which are influencing how you might respond to that issue that the data is identified. So the localism bill is, is the one I always cite here. So this is a, um, a recent piece of legislation, which is the last, the last parliament, um, which set the, the framework, if you like, for, for local groups to have more say in um, how services are delivered locally, um, how assets are developed or disposed of. So if your local authority wants to dispose of an asset, the localism bill um, gives local communities the right to to bid for to own that asset or to challenge how that asset might be disposed of. Um, but also there are, there are other policy contexts out there which are relevant. So you might refer um, to health and wellbeing agendas if you're looking at ill health or, or supporting people's wellbeing locally. Um, these talk often about the need to promote just not just good health but also good mental wellbeing. Um, so is that a driver for how you designed your R Place program? Thinking also, is there um, information perhaps from the police or um, emergency services around how they want to deliver services locally? Does your R Place program link into that, for instance? So think about all those policies and strategies that exist locally and nationally, which support your case for action. Finally, in this box, and, and the question at the bottom here gives you an example of, of what you need to put. So what needs to be in place for change to occur? So, for instance, do local residents and or service providers need to adopt new attitudes? So why is the current way of delivering services within your target area not working? You know, what's wrong about the current approach and how will your approach overcome those issues? So that's the top left-hand corner of your logic model. Moving down then to consider the bottom left-hand pieces, so objectives, rationale, inputs, activities and outputs. The objectives box here is perhaps the easiest one to complete. Um, this is uh, just a high level summary, often in bullet points, of what your R Place proposal is hoping to achieve in the medium to longer term. Many of you probably have experience writing business cases or business plans in the, the public or the private sector or, or the third sector as well. Um, and often those will include right up front two or three bullets saying, this program is about achieving X, Y, and Z. All you need to do here is produce something similar for your uh, R Place proposal. Underneath that, these boxes, rationale to outputs, the chevrons. So these are slightly more um, tricky to get your head around, but hopefully I can explain them nice and simply to, to you. So starting with rationale then, this is perhaps the trickiest of the four. Um, this is asking you, so why have you designed the delivery of your R Place program as you have? And why will the problem that your local area faces or your community face, why will that problem not go away of its own accord? Why do we have to spend money and manpower to get rid of this issue, if you like? Um, to give an example, um, let's imagine that I was proposing to uh, turn use community asset into a community hub um, and to co-locate health, police, council services within that one hub. The rationale for doing so there, because all those services will be provided at other venues across the borough, um, my rationale might be that um, lots of people within this community have mobility issues, uh, so therefore they cannot access these services elsewhere in the borough. Um, they just cannot travel to them um, when they need to access the services. So by putting all those services locally within an easy to access, well-known venue, it's far more likely that people will approach those services when they need them and that those services will be able to intervene soon enough in someone's lives to prevent a future crisis, to, so to prevent um, a hospital admission or somebody uh, losing a job or whatever it might be. So my rationale would be around accessibility in that case. Think about your proposal, think about why it's designed and think, how is this going to be better than business as usual than how services are currently provided? Um, you can, in the rationale box, refer, if you've done some research, for instance, with local clients or residents, they might tell you, you know, we want services delivered in these ways, or 
the inverse of that, they might tell you, this is why I don't currently engage with service provision. So have a look, see if you've got some of that evidence to hand. Moving to the right, so inputs. In this box, we need you to list the, the funding, the staffing, uh, the equipment and facilities that you have available to you, or you will have hopefully available to you from uh, April 2016 to begin delivering your R Place program. So the staffing one should be quite straightforward. Um, I'd imagine that will be a few staff working full time or part time on the project. Um, but also think about are other agencies in the local patch, are they going to be seconding staff in? Um, are they going to be giving you? Um, a few hours a week support, you know, is it half a day of a, a local um, council officer's time to support this project? Um, likewise, are, are, if a registered social landlord or a housing provider, are they going to be providing you with staff time on a, on a, a casual basis? If that is the case, then you need to note that down in here. Don't just um, cite your own resources internally, cite the resources of your partners as well, staffing resources. Um, the money side of things, again, that should be hopefully fairly straightforward. Are you going to have some, some core grants or, or core loans from, from partners? Uh, and also here, you need to think about in-kind support. So what I mean by that is, um, are people going to be giving you their time or their equipment but not charging you for that? So volunteers is often the most obvious example. Um, are you going to be relying on volunteers to undertake and deliver activities? If you are, then you should reference that in this input box. The reason being is that um, those volunteers could be uh, undertaking other activities uh, for which they could be earning a wage uh, and paying taxes, for instance. Um, so the guidance often from government and from, from various volunteering bodies is that we need to, to put a value on volunteers' input to make sure it's truly recognised. Likewise, if you're given uh, a venue free of charge a few afternoons a week or um, completely free of charge, you know, with, with no rent to, to pay, you need to work out the value of that in-kind contribution and include that in your input box. So that's input then. Moving to the right, um, what um, will those resources buy you in terms of day-to-day -day activities? So what is your R Place partnership going to be doing on a daily basis? So that might be uh, setting up community events, that might be um, building a, a new community hub venue, um, it might be running training programs for long-term unemployed residents. Um, whatever you're going to do, you need to cite those day-to-day -day activities in, in this box here. Uh, and then link to that the outputs box. So these are, if you like, the measurable or, or quantifiable results of your daily activities. So if my activity is to run community events um, on a regular basis, uh, my outputs might be um, 10 community events. So the number of community events I'll run is going to be, be 10. Um, likewise, if my activities was to put on uh, training courses for long-term unemployed residents, the output from that might be um, 200 residents to partake in training, to, to attend a training course. So outputs, if you like, these are the, the simple to count numbers uh, of your daily day-to-day -day activities, um, the sorts of things which give you um, a feel every week or every month about how your progress is going. So are we getting enough clients through the door? Are we running as many activities as we thought we would? Or are we ahead of target? Or are we falling behind target for whatever reason? So if you like the daily, what they're often termed in public sector speak is, is key performance indicators. So that's what you need in your, your outputs box. And that completes this bottom left-hand portion of the logic model. Just before we move on to consider outcomes and impacts, we're just going to have a sip of water. Okay, so we filled in the left-hand side of our logic model template. And this means that a casual reader of your logic model should quickly understand, you know, within 15 minutes or so, okay, these are the problems within that R-Place partnership's local area. 
and this is what they are doing on a day-to-day -day basis in order to try and overcome those problems. What we now need to tell the casual reader is, if those activities are successful, what changes are going to be evident within the community's lives and within the wider society that our place project is based. So firstly then, intended outcomes. So what are you trying to achieve for your residents or your clients? Um, examples of outcomes, perhaps the easiest way to understand this, things like um, improvements in residents' long-term health, that would be an outcome. Uh, more people volunteering, that would be an outcome. Um, closer working between public agencies and the voluntary sector. So that's an outcome. It's not an outcome for your residents or your clients, but it's an outcome for your partnership. So when you're thinking about outcomes, don't just think about them from your client's perspective. Think also from your partnership's perspective. An outcome, another process outcome, though, as those are often termed, might be something like um, greater awareness between agencies of what each can offer. So um, you might say, after a few years of working, we should understand better who's expert to lead on certain client needs, um, and in which cases other agencies should lead. So, so better information sharing between agencies, for instance. Um, another outcome might be something like young people entering sustained employment. So we've gone beyond the output of saying, you know, we're going to have 200 people in a training course, to saying, and the medium term outcome of that will be um, a number of those 200 people securing sustained employment. Um, so it's not just getting a piece of paper from your training, it's then getting a job on the back of that piece of paper. So those are outcomes. What's the difference then between outcomes and impacts? Don't worry if you uh, find it difficult to distinguish between those two terms. Um, they're often used rather lazily and interchangeably, um, which can make it hard to understand their difference. Um, but the way I often describe it is think about outcomes are the things that you will be measuring and collecting. So they're changes in your clients' lives, um, situations. Whereas impacts are things that other people measure and report. So they are changes in underlying measures of a society's well-being and economy's performance, for instance. So to try and make that clearer, um, a few examples of impacts. So if an outcome is an improvement in residents' long-term health, then the impact might be um, a reduction in hospital admission rates. So you helping to improve the health of your clients will go some way to reducing hospital admission rates, as recorded by the Hospital Trust. But there'll be lots of other things going on within society, within your borough, or within your county, which would also affect hospital admission rates. So the measuring of those uh, hospital admission rates, that would be done by the trust, um, not by yourselves, for instance. And then they publish it through national statistics, through their regular uh, performance monitoring, for instance. Um, to give another example, um, if we said one of our outcomes is around uh, more young people entering sustained employment, then the impact I'd expect to see within the wider economy would be a reduction in the unemployment rate of 16 to 24-year-olds. Uh, so again, you'd be having one impact on that, but there'd be a whole range of wider economic factors, macroeconomic things, which would also affect youth unemployment rates within your area. So that's the difference between impacts and outcomes. As I say, the, the written guide that is um, published on the, on the website um, takes a bit more time to explain the difference between them. So if you, if you do get confused, I recommend you refer back to that. Okay then, so let's imagine but we've filled in a, a logic model, we've got it in front of us, um, we can then hand that over to, to partners, um, to other agencies, and they should, a good test for logic model is, if after 10, 15 minutes of looking at it, they have a good understanding of what your proposal is about. You've been able to, um, in a visual way, get across your ideas, in a, and it's far easier than giving someone a, a 40, 50 page business plan and saying, read that, that tells you what we're going to do. Um, this is a very visual, quick way of getting that information across. So, the re remaining part of this webinar, then, we're going to start to populate one of these logic models. Uh, and we're going to do so using uh, the, the Poplar R-Place example. 
Um, but before we do it, I'll just explain to you a bit about what they're doing in, in Tower Hamlets um, around their R Place activity. So the R Place uh, activity in Tower Hamlets is focused, well, this is one of the pioneer areas from a few years back. And they're focused on two wards, uh, so Bromley by Bow and Mile End East, um, both of which are a very deprived parts of a very deprived borough in London. Um, it's an ethnically diverse borough, and we'll come on to consider why that's important in terms of how they design their approach, uh, a large Bangladeshi community. Um, and the Poplar team have done quite a lot of research and discussions with local GP groups um, which has shown that diabetes is a real challenge in the area. So high rates of diabetes, um, and those high rates of diabetes were putting a strain on the NHS. And that was in terms of quite a lot of A&E appointments and hospital admissions, which were related to diabetes, um, and in particular diabetes not being very well managed. So people reaching a crisis point in their health, um, having to call an ambulance, having to be admitted to hospital for a few days to manage that crisis before then being returned home. So that was the, the core issue that the team identified. Um, but they also had discussions with um, the, the GPs and they said, you know, how can we get people to, to better manage their health uh, and to avoid these crisis moments? And the, the consensus was this isn't just about um, weight or lack of physical activity, for instance. It's also about the wider factors. So do our clients have um, access to training provision? Um, do they feel like they can get a job? Um, is their well-being um, at a stage where their health will improve as a result? So the, the consensus was we need to design something which addresses not just diabetes, but also the wider determinants of health, something that's often called social prescribing. So in response to that research and those issues, um, the Our Place team in Poplar developed a, a project which combined firstly a, a health focus um, through the development of what they called healthcare packages with a wider community engagement strand which linked into the idea of social prescribing. So people who were at risk of, of diabetes or had diabetes would be supported through a healthcare package but they'd also receive wider support around healthy living, um, skills and training, health awareness, and um, the idea being that that wider activity um, would help them to manage their own health rather than relying on statutory provision. Um, the activities within that, so GPs were involved in developing their healthcare packages, um, but they'd also, once they worked with someone to develop their healthcare package, pair them up with a local volunteer, and that local volunteer would be able to support the resident to access all those wider services, be it skills, training, uh, debt advice, benefits advice. So they'd help them navigate all those other services, which is just as important in keeping people healthy and with a good level of well-being. Um, one of the, uh, the local training college, the local FE college, volunteered to support the project, as did the, the local housing provider who gave access to a local community centre, the Burdett Centre, um, for the running of various community events and the hosting of training courses. Um, so that was, in a nutshell, um, what the, the R Place team in, in Poplar developed as their response to the challenges that they faced. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start to think about turning that information into a, a logic model. Flipping back then, this is the, uh, the model, uh, the template the logic model that I introduced to you. And we're going to fill this in in reverse. So we're going to start with the intended impact. Then we're going to step back to consider, OK, what are the outcomes for residents that are needed to deliver those wider societal impacts? Then we'll describe the nuts and bolts of the popular activity. And then we'll flow back to the conditions, the contextual factors, which hopefully should be removed if the popular our place proposals are a success. When you come to filling in your own template over the next four weeks, um, you can fill it in either way. You can start, as we're going to do today, from the end and work backwards, or you can start from the contextual factors that you've identified and work forwards. Either way is just as good. Um, some people find it easier to start with a, what do we ultimately want to achieve and, and step back. 
others might start from a what's the problem and develop it going forwards. I say either way is fine. So starting then in terms of intended impacts. So thinking back to what we've just discussed about pot plants, the key impact that they want to see as measured by the, the NHS Hospital Trust is fewer hospital admissions and where people are admitted to hospital, for that admission to be shorter. So for people to be in hospital for less time uh, and to get back to, back home as quickly as possible. Because the research shows that people like to, to get out of hospital and back into their home environment as quick as possible. So that is the key number one impact they'd like to deliver in the medium to longer term. They'd also like to see uh, an improvement in health metrics generally within Bromley by Bow and Mile End East. So that would be things like more people saying that they take regular exercise. It would be uh, a reduction in the number of percentage of the population who are classed as overweight or obese, because people would have access to information. They'd be taking better, better care of their health. So improved health metrics, um, but also there'd be changes in metrics which relate to those wider determinants of health that we discussed. So would we expect to see improvements in local skill levels? So more residents within those two wards with uh, GCSEs or with NVQs, um, more residents with A-levels perhaps, because they've been on training courses provided through the, through the activities um, and they've managed to improve their skills. If they've improved their skills, then we'd hope also to see more residents employment and a reduction in the local unemployment rate. So those are some of the key impacts. Also, one further impact to consider, um, this approach was very much around working with the community. Um, so you'd expect to see in the longer term um, enhanced community satisfaction with service provision. So if you ask Bromley by Bow and Mile and East residents in a few years' time, um, are you satisfied with the service you receive from your GPs or from your, your registered social landlord? Um, if this activity was a success, we'd expect to see higher percentages saying yes, they were satisfied or very satisfied. So those were a, that's a, a brief version of some of the impacts that the uh, Poplar team put in their logic model. Taking a step back from that then, so what outcomes will uh, we need to uh, deliver for the clients of the Poplar project? Uh, in order to um, deliver those impacts. Well, firstly, we, in order to get fewer and shorter hospital admissions, we need people with diabetes or at risk of diabetes to, to be able to better manage their condition. So if they have diabetes, we need them to be more informed about diet and activity uh, and to manage their care. Um, and we'd also hope to see reduced usage of the amongst the client group. So because they were um, better able to manage their own health, they'd uh, put less of a, a strain on uh, GPs, for instance, by GP appointments. Um, and they'd also have increased awareness of health issues, so healthy living initiatives, for instance. We'd also link to that. One of the points that the Poplar team found from their early research was that um, diabetes and ill health within the two wards wasn't just putting a strain on people with those conditions but also other family members who were caring for them. So there were family members who weren't able to take up um, employment or other opportunities because they were caring for another family member. So one of the outcomes we were hoping to deliver would be reduced use, uh, need for carers within the local community because people would be managing their own health um, in a better way thanks to the help of um, the Our Place project. Those wider determinants of health, um, so we also expect to see if people are going to increase their skills and increase their employment prospects. So we would hope to see um, the gaining of qualifications amongst the client group, so people completing training courses. We would hope to see sustained employment amongst the client group, so people getting into a job and retaining that job for, for several months, not just for, for a few weeks and then dropping back onto uh, the unemployment register. Um, some of the wider process outcomes. Um, I mentioned at the start that it was very much a program based around volunteering, so volunteers being matched to clients. So 
So one of the intended outcomes within the community would be an increase in the volunteering rate, the number of people saying that they volunteer. Um, and just generally uh, an outcome around more community engagement, so more links between the community and between service providers, leading to that longer term impact around satisfaction of the community with the services they receive. So those are the outcomes that we need to put in this box. Um, we're just going to break now an opportunity for some questions and then we'll return to our template. So Gareth, can I just ask, have there been any questions put for me to answer? Gareth? Are you there? Sorry, hello. Sorry, is that better? Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. You now. can hear me now, sorry. Uh, yeah, so we've had a question from Catherine uh, Hewitson from the Winch and Camden, uh, and it's regarding the inputs. It's going back to the beginning of, of your presentation. And Catherine wants to know, is this about what's required from next April or from now? So that's in relation to inputs. Yes, Catherine. Um, everything that you put in your, your logic model should if you like, relate from relate to the, the situation as you hope it will be on the, the 1st of April 2016. So you should be describing the structures you hope to have in place from then, uh, the, the funding, the resources behind that, the activities you plan to deliver. And I realise that for many areas, those um, ideas from April onwards are still in development. Uh, you might not know exactly how much funding you'll have, exactly what the starting picture will look like, exactly what activities you'll undertake. Um, in those instances, try and give a, a summary of what they might look like. So, you know, you hope to have staff input from uh, the local clinic and clinical commissioning group. Um, you hope to be delivering these kind of activities to roughly this number of, of residents. Um, I'd imagine you have a, a pretty good feel for your local area, um, for the numbers of people within that area who might need your support. So you should be able to use that feel to, to start to scope out the, the scale of your activities. Um, the, if you think about it, last year when we did this, um, with the 14, 15 our place areas, some areas did submit logic models which um, told the story of their, their preparatory year's work. Um, so the activities, for instance, were have regular partnership meetings. Um, the outcomes were have a partnership in place. Now, when we came to review that, what that meant was that the team, as we sat there around the table at DCLG, we had no idea what the, the proposal was really about. We didn't know if it was about youth unemployment or support for elderly residents who were isolated, for instance. So we couldn't judge whether it was um, a proposal that was worth supporting or was duplicating activity elsewhere in the local area. So, so in summary, yes, you need to, as far as you can, um, populate the logic model about next year's activities. So, so it tells a story rather of next year's activities. Okay. Okay, and then there's another comment more than a question. It, it seems too early to be able to know uh, what resources you require because some of the meetings to determine that haven't happened yet. So is there something you could say about that, please, David? Um, sorry, can you explain that again? I didn't quite understand so, what the point is. So I think the, the, the comment is that uh, some of the meetings to determine what the resources are haven't happened yet. So yeah. I think some people are feeling this is quite an early stage to be able to know that. How, how do we address that? Yeah, I, I think that sort of links to my previous answer. So if you know you're going to be meeting with um, statutory bodies or, or other voluntary sector partners who you want to bring into this, um, in your logic model, I suppose, you, you want to be describing what you think is going to be the ask of those agencies and hopefully what they will be able to offer you, um, whether that's grants, whether that's um, staffing time, whether that's equipment or a, or a venue or something like that. Um, obviously, in your logic model, when you submit it, um, you can put, you know, to be, to be confirmed type stars, if you like, against certain resources, certain activities. Um, but to try and describe, you know, ideally this is what our, our place proposal will look like from next year onwards. Okay, and some um, practical questions. Uh, how long does the logic model take to complete? Um, getting a first draft down shouldn't take more than a, a few hours, I'd suggest. 
Um, it's nice and it, it's logically set out, as you'd imagine. Um, and it, in that first instance, it's really just sort of distilling what's probably in various partnerships' heads or they've written down through various minutes of meetings and so on into, into a, a diagram. Um, once you've got that first draft, um, what I recommend is that it's shared around your partnership um, and through a sort of iterative process over a few weeks, but not full time over a few weeks, um, you develop it further. Um, so you'll, what you'll find is that different partnership uh, members probably have different ideas about the key activities uh, and the outcomes that will result, just because they've got different professional experiences, different um, measures of what success might look like. So, so share it via email or through meetings. Um, and develop version 2, version 3, version 4, for instance. Um, that process should give yourself a, a few weeks, give everyone a chance to, to contribute. Um, and that should mean that by the end of July, you have a, a version that everyone's had a chance to look at, to comment on, uh, and submit that into to Jim and the team at, uh, at Locality. Any other questions, Gareth? Yeah. Answer? So uh, a, comment, a question about... Um you mentioned about increased skills, uh, saying it was an impact, and there's about clarity. Uh, somebody wants to know: is that not more of an outcome? Uh, increased, increased skills. Um, so, in that instance, what I was referring to was the the, um, the measure of skills. So, skills are um, you can get national data on the skills profile of areas. So. For instance, if I was looking at a ward in Manchester, I could uh, download data from the ONS, which would tell me how many residents within that ward have a degree, how many have A-levels as their highest qualification, how many have no qualifications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if there's an R-place activity within that ward, then the R-place activity might be helping 50 or 100 residents improve their skills and change their profile. But there'll also be um, a range of other activities in that ward. So there might be a, a further education college providing training. Uh, there might be other voluntary groups running courses, for instance. There'll be a, there might be a, a secondary school based in the ward. So all those different publicly funded or, or other funded activities um, will be helping to influence the skills profile of that ward. So in, in this example, I suppose what I'm saying is that the outcome would be um, are clients gaining qualifications, i.e. a proxy for a qualification is a proxy for improved skills, um, and the impact of a wider measure is a change in, in the skills profile of the area as reported in national data. So yeah, that, that's an example, I suppose, where distinguishing between the outcome and impact is, is slightly trickier, but hopefully that's, that's given people an idea of what I mean. Okay, uh, another question. If you have more than one theme, do you have to do more than one logic model? This is a, a question that's asked quite a lot. Um, the, the advice generally is yes. If you have two or more themes to your R-Place proposal um, and they're working with sort of quite different groups, so one might be working with older residents and one with younger residents, then it's far easier for yourselves and for reviewers at locality um, to see those set out on two separate uh, logic models. Um, because um, I'm guessing that the, the activities that you'll deliver to those two client groups and the outcomes that you might be hoping to see are probably quite different. So for the older people in this instance, it might be you know, reducing social isolation. Um, but that's not an outcome that has any relevance to the younger people that you're going to be working with. So then the outcome might be around reducing antisocial behavior um, or giving young people uh, more things to do of, it, of an evening, for instance. So if you tried to put that in one logic model, I'd look at it and go, OK, so is this about giving older people more things to do in the evening? Or have you got a load of socially isolated 16-year-olds locally? So it would get confusing. So keep them separate, yes. Okay, uh, just a bit of clarity, please, David. Uh, NCB in the popular in in the popular project. What does NCB mean? What does neighbourhood community budget? Brilliant. It was an early acronym for our place type activities. Ah, right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And so community budget should be sort of government speak, which was fashionable about three years ago, maybe. 
probably have been superseded by something at DCLG now. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, just a, a question as well. Are there any? Uh, sorry. Um, sorry. Um, yeah. So uh, logic models might come across as slightly dry or scary for a group engagement process, especially with communities. Uh, have you seen any particular interesting or engaging ways an area has that um, has had a group conversation on a logic model? So I was thinking about. Um. It. I mean, the, the logic model work that we, I lead in Greater Manchester, the way we often do it is just print it out, uh, print out some A3 sheets of the logic model, and then just hold a, a sort of workshop where just split a partnership up into to small groups and say, you know, you go away and, and populate this section of the logic model, and this group go and do that one, and then come back and, and present what you think your proposal is about. Um, and then it's the opportunity for the other groups to to challenge that, if you like, and um, I'd say I've, I've never found people to be to be scared of it. To be honest, I think it's a far more interactive, accessible way than um, perhaps what you might term the traditional public sector approach of, um, you know, dense documents and application forms, and you know, citing various legal and statutory instruments which enables you to do something. Um, I think very much just treat it as a um, a fun exercise where we think, as a group, you know, what do we think we're actually here to do or hoping to do, um, and a chance for some um, some open challenge of that and saying, have we really thought this through ourselves? So the workshop style approach, I suppose, in summary, is perhaps the best way I reckon of doing this. Okay, so uh, just a few more questions. Are any of the key health agency partners in the popular NCB, NCB project able to provide help and support to their peer health agency leaders in other areas of the country who may be interested to undertake an Our Place project with other local partners? Um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't know the answer to that. Um, okay. I'd suggest that through the Our Place network, so there's the... Um, the network that everyone should be invited to and various online forums and so on and um, that would be the, the obvious way to get in contact with the uh, the Poplar team um, to understand how their proposals are progressing and so on. Okay and uh, just two more final questions when we submit the logic model if we haven't got final numbers is this an issue? As, as I said at the start of, of the Q, this bit of a Q&A. Not really, no. I mean, as long as you can give a, a sort of rough idea um, of the numbers of people you might be working with, the number of events you run, um, I'd suggest, you know, you should by now be starting to get those those numbers at your fingertips and understanding you know, what's the fabric of the area we're working with. You know, if you don't already know, you know, how many residents are within your area or um, some of the data on the key challenges faced, then, then I think that is, is something you, I'd suggest you have to prioritise because I don't think you can design a, an intervention without having a clear idea of the numbers of people who might want to benefit from that and, and how they might go about doing that. So I think you're yeah, not uh, an issue if you don't have the exact you know, decimal place numbers, um, but you should be able to get uh, by the end of July a, a fairly rough idea of your numbers and number of activities and so on. Okay. And can you still make a decision about the cost-benefit analysis if there isn't anything quantifiable in your uh, logic model at this stage? Uh, yes, we can, because the, the decision we take is really around, um, firstly, the, the scale of what's being proposed. Um, so as we'll discuss, there's no point doing a cost-benefit analysis on something that is, is very small. Um, likewise, um, we look at the outcomes and input, impact boxes and we try and get a feel for how easy it is to, to put value on those outcomes. Um, something I'll describe later on in the, in the webinar, um, but certain outcomes um, are quite hard to put a value on. In those cases, we might say to an area, um, we don't think it's worth trying to do a cost-benefit analysis of this, it would be, be too tricky. Uh, but as I say, we'll, we'll take a bit more time on that later on in the webinar. Okay. Okay, that's the, the that's the final question. So, do you want to go on with the rest of the uh, webinar? Yes. We'll, we'll return now to, to the template. Um, you'll remember that we 
filled in the impacts and the outcomes boxes for, for the popular proposal. So now we need to describe the nuts and bolts of what they are doing locally in this bottom left hand section. So the high level outputs, and these aren't all of the outputs that they, they're monitoring, um, but the high level ones were around developing this idea of healthcare packages, um, running training, uh, providing training places, and recruiting volunteers. So those are the, the three key metrics that they can look at on an almost daily basis and understand how well they're doing. So they said, firstly, we're going to, we've got enough resource to um, develop 2,000 of these healthcare packages. So we've worked with GP clinical commissioning group and we've looked at the numbers of people locally with diabetes or risk of diabetes and we think that we can work with 2,000 of those individuals through the development of the healthcare package. We also think within that group uh, a smaller percentage are going to need uh, employment and skills support um, and the Further Education College is going to be running this training course. They've given us 300 funded places on that training course. So residents who need support, they won't have to pay anything, they'll receive free training uh, and 300 residents can access that training. And then finally they said, how many volunteers will we need to support 2,000 people on healthcare packages? Obviously not all 2,000 at the same time. Uh, and they said we'll need to recruit 50 volunteers uh, and train them up. So the, the key output measures that they report against or that they consider themselves against uh, set out there in that chevron. In terms of the activities needed on a daily basis to meet those targets, um, obviously the work of GPs in developing the healthcare packages will be crucial. So I think they reached an agreement that the standard GP um, slot, I think it's about 12 minutes using the NHS guidelines, so they had an agreement with the CCG that that could be lengthened to 20 or 30 minutes, I think it was. So that will be one of the daily activities of the partnership. Um, there'd also need to be um, the, the running of training courses so that those 300 residents could, could go on a training course. Um, there'd also need to be um, a regular support for volunteers. So if those 50 volunteers came across a particularly thorny issue with one client, that there could be somebody within the partnership who could advise, uh, if necessary, take over the issue. So volunteer support would be a daily activity. Um, and also, and think about this in terms of your own proposals, um, there'd be the publicity and awareness raising of this new approach. So just because um, an activity um, is designed doesn't mean that people will automatically access that. Um, you might need to publicize your activities through regular community events or a website, for instance. So a core part of Poplar's work was around publicising this new approach to diabetes and health management in general. So that's just summarised their activities. In terms of the inputs they had available to them to deliver those activities, um, so various agencies were giving staff time or are giving staff time to the activity. So um, the registered social landlord, uh, an organisation called Poplar Harker, H-A-R-C-A, -A. Um, they gave uh, considerable staff time to this, both sort of full-time positions but also uh, part-time support from other officers within the organisation. Um, we've already mentioned that GPs within the local clinical commissioning group had agreed to give extra time uh, to clients who were accepted onto the scheme. Um, the community centre at which um, the volunteers could meet with uh, the participants and also at which the training courses could be delivered. So that was given over to the partnership, uh, rent three, um, but in their inputs box they noted that uh, and put a value around that. And finally the Department of Work and Pensions, um, they agreed to pay for the 300 training places. So uh, local colleges have set tariffs for certain training courses. Um, and they agreed that they would send the, the cost of those training places uh, that would be charged to Department of Work and Pensions through, through Job Centre Plus, um, rather than um, the, the residents receiving a, a, a bill for, for attending a training course. So that's just summarising the, the core inputs in terms of staff time, money, 
um, and uh, resources. Um, you'll note that the Poplar team they did have, uh, and the other the trailblazer areas, they had um, an R Place grant from, from DCLG to develop their work, but that was in their first 12 months when they were setting up and, and developing their ideas. So it's not referenced in this input box here. Um, they've just referenced um, their, their sort of go live resources, if you like. In terms of the rationale for why the, the Poplar neighborhood community budget was designed as it was. Um, the first point to put in this box is, is around the research that the, the team had done. So they'd done their homework. They knew that diabetes and poor health was a real challenge for the community. Um, so in the rationale box, they referenced that high prevalence of diabetes and the fact that it was getting worse. So obviously services as they were presently configured were not challenging. They were not overcoming that problem some new approach was needed. So that was one point. And secondly, in the rationale box, they reference the fact that research shows that there are multiple causes of poor health. So it's not just physical inactivity or poor diet. It might also be uh, financial money worries and stresses and strains. It might be around poor housing, um, so damp conditions, overcrowding within, uh, within the home. So by taking this approach where um, staff from other agencies, not just the GPs, were involved, um, and also by putting a volunteer with each participant who could talk about those wider determinants of health, um, the rationale was that uh, you'd be able to tackle multiple causes of poor health, and it'd be more likely that somebody would succeed um, as a result. Finally, they talked about having a tailored approach, so one volunteer to one participant, um, that means that um, th uh, interventions could be sequenced. So if it was decided that somebody's debt issues were the key cause of their ill health or, or lack of economic activity, the volunteer could work with the client on their, their debt issues first and foremost. Um, the client needs would be met as they needed them to be met, um, not as some public agency's time table dictated. So a, a tailored approach they felt would be, be far more effective. So those are those rationale points. Just finally then in terms of program objectives. So these were summarized, uh, three of them. Um, firstly, the our place Poplar team said, um, we want to deliver healthcare packages with community support. So that was their high level objective. Their second high level objective was that we want to develop more cost effective ways of managing the community's health. So they gave themselves a financial imperative, if you like, to develop more cost-effective approaches. And thirdly, and this is this point around process, so we didn't just think about objectives for their residents, but also objectives for themselves. And they said, we want to develop a, a model of managing community's health, which can be replicated elsewhere in Tower Hamlets and elsewhere in East London. Because they acknowledge that the problems they faced was more severe, um, weren't that unusual. There are other parts of the capital which might be able to benefit from this um, healthcare packages and volunteer type approach. So those were their three core objectives. Just before we go on to finish the model by looking at the conditions box, um, just to chart any questions that have been posted in the last 10 minutes or so. So, Gareth, if I can return to you, anything that I need to answer? Uh, no, nothing, uh, no other questions right now, but uh, we do have another Q&A session at the very end, so if you do have any questions, uh, don't, don't hesitate to post them, and uh, we can answer them. Okay, thank you. So, just back then, finally, to completing the last part of the logic model for Poplar. So, this is around the, the conditions that they're faced with. So for the, the sake of space and expediency, I haven't actually populated this with numbers and percentages. Um, I've just summarized the sorts of statistics and strategy documents that the Poplar team looked at. So we've already talked quite a lot around the poor health of the area. So they access data from uh, the ONS, from the local trust, from their GPs to understand uh, overall levels of health within the borough, within the, the wards rather. Um, they looked at numbers of people locally with diabetes 
and numbers of people at risk of developing diabetes. Uh, they got data from their um, hospital trust around the number of admissions to A&E and how many of those were diabetes related. So these are all the types of data that they cited in this box. Um, they also looked more generally at um, statistics around deprivation. So there are various national publications. Um, there's an index of multiple deprivation which is published every few years and that gives you a whole range of data which shows how affluent or how deprived um, a, a neighbourhood or a, a ward is um, within a, a borough or within a county um, or within a district. So they looked, they cited that data um, and they also cited the data around the ethnic diversity of the area. Um, the reason for doing so was that ethnic diversity closely informed their delivery model. So they understood that to engage with people from the Bangladeshi community, it was best if they did that through volunteers from that community themselves, that people were more likely to um, take and, and listen to advice from uh, fellow members of their community. So they looked at, at that issue as well, also from an issue of, of age and, uh, and gender and so on. So those were some of the data points they put in this box. Um, they also, in terms of policy, so they cited um, a lot of the, the health and wellbeing agenda that the clinical committee groups were interested in and which uh, Public Health England and Department of Health are interested in. So that's this idea of if you want to improve someone's health, don't just focus on symptoms, but also focus on the wider determinants of that health. So is someone's mental well-being as good as it could be? Are they in a job? Um, do they have a happy home life, for instance? So they cited that agenda because that was fundamental to their, to their volunteer-based approach of supporting people across their lives and not just giving them drugs to manage their diabetes. Um, they also talked a lot about uh, the budgetary pressures that the local authorities of Tower Hamlets Borough um, and other partners were facing and suggesting that you know, this approach with um, a more cost-effective approach um, because we're relying more on volunteers um, and we should deliver fewer um, crises interventions, be that through adult social services or be that at the A&E front desk. So that should save us money and contribute to the, the wider need to reduce our budgets. Just finally then, in terms of what needs to be in place for change to occur, so the partnership agreed that this model they're proposing was fundamentally about getting local residents to take responsibility for proactively managing their own health. So not thinking that um, health, their health was something that um, an expert would advise them on through a, a GP appointment or, or turning up at A&E, but it was something that they themselves could manage. Um, but it was also around giving those individuals um, the opportunities and the resources to manage their health. So it wasn't just about telling people, look after your health better, please. It was also about saying, here's some advice about how you can go about doing that. Here's a volunteer who's going to support you on that journey. So it was about giving people the opportunity and the resources to proactively manage their health. So that is a, a summary, if you like, of the, um, the theory of change, what needs to, to change locally for the Our Place proposal to be a success. So here's a, a completed logic model then. Um, in terms of um, the, the benefits of getting to this point, so if you imagine you've got one of these logic models completed for your proposal, um, you submit it at the end of July, you think, phew, that's done. Then you return to it after your summer holidays and you think, right, how, how are we going to use this logic model? Well, in terms of monitoring and evaluation, a logic model is, is really useful because it gives you, firstly, it, it tells you a whole load of data that you need to be collecting on a regular basis. So it tells me as a reviewer that um, I need to have a regular track of how many volunteers are on our pro program. Are we going to get to that 50 volunteer target? I need to have regular data at my fingertips on how many care packages we've developed. Again, so I can get a, a red, amber, green idea of are we on track or are we falling behind. In the medium to longer term, this tells me that I need to be gathering uh, information which tells me um, perhaps direct feedback from clients. Do they feel that they're managing their diabetes better as a result of the activities we've put in place? So is that information that's currently gathered? You know, our clients at the local GPs ask this on a regular basis, 
or do we need to institute some kind of survey or client feedback forms which we ask people to fill in every three or six months for instance. So it starts me thinking about feedback forms and, and client surveys. It also gets me to think about um, some of the more fundamental points around the design of my program. So I've designed this program, oh sorry, the Poplar team has designed this program because they reckon that um, a tailored approach to healthcare is going to be more effective. So do I need to be tracking diabetes rates or ill health rates in other parts of the country, which are similar to Mile End East and, and Bromley by Bow, and seeing if we're actually having a greater impact locally than in those other areas. So can I prove this assertion that tailored approaches to healthcare are more effective than the current public sector approach? So I'm starting to be able to formulate what we call hypotheses that can be tested through data gathering through sensible question answering. Um, so hopefully you've ever seen, if you've got a good, good logic model in place, it can inform your monitoring and evaluation. Thinking more immediate term, so things to focus on over the next uh, four weeks, steps to get into a good logic model. We've started to pick these up in some of the Q&A. Um, key amongst that is involving as many stakeholders as possible. Um, or, or just partnership agencies or individuals that have been involved and interested in your art place work. Um, so don't see this as something that you alone have to do over the next four weeks. Maybe the one person in your partnership starts the ball rolling and gets their thoughts down onto a, to a logic model. Um, but at that point, that person should email that proposal, that draft, around the group and say, you know, here's a, a word version of our logic model. Have I got the inputs, the activities, the outputs correct. If necessary, attach the logic model user guide to that or, or spend just half an hour explaining the logic model to them and then leave it with them or with that organization and say, right, over the next few days you develop this into a version two and then share it with the group again and then we'll develop it into a version three, version four and so on. The second tip here is around including numbers. Again, we've discussed this, but the idea that the more numbers you've got in early doors, uh, the better. Um, because if you put in numbers and it shows you that you know there are thousands of residents locally who could benefit from your program, that should be a, a sense check for you to say, well, do we have the capacity to work with thousands of residents? Or actually, do we only have the capacity to work with a few hundred residents? Do we need to consider, as a result of that, eligibility criteria? So is it a first-come, first-served basis? Or are we going to target our activities on those who really need our support? Um, so it helps you to start tailoring uh, and thinking about um, the structures and the infrastructure you have in place to deliver your activities. So include as many numbers as you can, accepting, of course, that um, you may still be in discussions around how many staff you're going to have access to or um, how many people locally might need your support. Once you've completed your logic model, perhaps before submitting it to, to Jim and the team at locality, just ask yourself some of these questions of it. So is there really the evidence there to underpin what you're proposing to do? So if you do dig into the, the local and national data and it's showing you that what you thought was a problem isn't really that great a deal. You know, actually there are, there are only a few residents facing this problem, it's just that they're very vocal, so it seems like there's a big issue. Or there is an issue here, but it's no worse than in neighbouring areas of the district or neighbouring parts of the county. So is there really a case for doing something different and extra within our local area? So ask yourself that question. Um, we talked a bit around, is it doable? So do you have resources to meet the demand you're likely to face? Um, are you going to be able to meet that demand within the however many years that you're hoping to operate for? Um, is it testable? So if you know what outcomes you're hoping to deliver, um, are you going to be able to get data which shows that those outcomes have uh, materialized? Or are you going to have to design your own client surveys and feedback sheets? Um, remember, just because data is not reported by the local authority or gathered in a uniform way, that doesn't mean that you can't host focus groups or run interviews with clients to try and get their verbal feedback on whether those outcomes have been achieved. Um, and finally, ask yourself, you know, are these outcomes important and worth the effort? Are there enough of them? Do they mean enough to, uh, to local people? 
Um, you know, we often say that look at what your program is aiming to achieve, and then imagine if I was at a public meeting and I stood up and I said, "This is what this program is about." Would people think that that was worthwhile? Would they support us in that activity and that endeavour? So I think are your your outcomes important and worth the effort that you're going to be putting in? So those are some good um, things to do when you're completing your logic model, and then questions to ask once you you've completed it and you you submitted it to, to Jim and the team for review. In terms of how a logic model once completed will support your cost benefit analysis. I do remember here that not all of you are going to be able to complete a cost benefit analysis. For those of you who whose proposal involves outcomes which are very hard to put a value on, you won't need to do a cost benefit analysis. Um, for those of you whose proposals are, are quite small scale, it wouldn't be proportionate to a cost benefit analysis. Um, likewise, some of you might be proposing something that's extremely complex, where lots of agencies are going to be working to deliver lots of different outcomes. In those instances, it might be really hard to definitively show that it was your intervention which led to a certain outcome. Again, in those instances, you won't be needed to do a cost benefit. For those of you who are, you know, the, the 60, 65 percent probably who will need to do a cost benefit analysis, if you've got a good logic model by the summer, then it will make doing the cost benefit analysis in the autumn so much easier. That's because you'll be able to take bits of your logic model template and not quite drop it into the cost benefit analysis Excel, Excel tool, um, but not far off that. Um, on the cost side of things, by looking at what you put in the boxes titled inputs, activities, outputs, um, in some of those boxes you'll have pounds and pence numbers already. So you might have um, direct reference to grants or um, loans that you're going to receive to undertake your activities. Alternatively, it might say the number of the outputs that you're going to be delivering, so 100 training courses or whatever, and then it would be a pretty simple job to say, well, at £100 per training course, that means that we're going to be spending £10,000 on training. So you can quickly put a pounds and pence figure on your activities. So that's what you can use those boxes for. And then in terms of putting a value on your benefits, looking at your impacts and outcomes boxes, um, the, the new economy Excel tool that you'll be using in the autumn, that has automatically can turn those outcomes and impacts. If you can tell it what your outcomes are, then it can put a value on those outcomes for you. So if you can tell it that your outcome is to reduce um, A&E admissions, the model already knows what an average A&E admission costs the taxpayer. So you just need to tell it the number of outcomes that you're going to be avoiding, as it were, and it can put a value on that for you. So, and it can do that for hundreds and hundreds of outcomes. Um, you just need to tell it which outcomes you're interested in. Um, I should say that there will be uh, webinars, there will be face-to-face -face training, there's the support from your relationship managers, and there will be one-to-one -one discussions between the team here at New Economy and our place areas to help you do this. Um, so don't fret at the moment if you don't have a clue about cost-benefit analysis. You will get that support in the autumn if you are required to produce a CBA. Um, so first step, if you do get to that stage, make sure you've got a good logic model. It will make the process in the autumn so much um, easier to complete. Right, just before we finish up with final Q&A, a, a chance for any, uh, a chance to just put a poll to see if I've achieved my objectives. So, Gareth, could you launch um, the poll? Uh, the question being, do you now feel ready to complete your logic model? Uh, there are five answers there. I'm hoping that quite a few of you will be saying, yes, you're ready to do that. Okay. Uh, so ready. Thanks. So the poll has been launched. So you should all now have the opportunity to uh, give your response. Gareth, if you could just track response rates and let me know when yeah. we are up to that 90 percent number. Okay, there's a few more before we get to 90 percent. Okay. okay. So there's 89% uh, 
89% have responded, so I'll close the poll right now and I'll share the results. There you go. Great. Okay. So yeah, so similar to um, what we had in the in the first webinar last week. So uh, a clear majority of you. So I'm, I'm squinting because it doesn't come up on my screen, but it looks like uh, a clear majority of you saying yes. You're ready to complete the poll either independently or with some help. Um, so in terms of that help, um, we've got a, this webinar is being run for relationship managers tomorrow. So if you have been paired with a relationship manager or you're about to, um, see them as a source of help. Um, likewise, uh, there's the, the online guidance to refer to, um, these slides and this webinar, the, the voice, uh, the, the description will be posted as well, as Gareth said at the start. So you can refer back to things there. And, and work as a group, remember, don't see this as something that you alone have to do over the next four weeks. Um, work with your colleagues in the partnership to get there. That's, that's really good to see. Um, so the person who answered some of it, I think that's one or a few people have answered some of it. Um, I'm guessing that's referring to the idea of bits and pieces of your, your activities and your inputs are still a bit unknown. Um, as I said in the, in the answers section, um, we realise that um, by the end of July you may still be in negotiations with our areas. Try and submit for the full figures for your inputs and your activities and so on. Um, but perhaps also when you submit your logic model, make it clear to Jim and the team that you're still firming up those numbers. Um, so when we do come to review them all in August at some point, um, we can just style your logic model and say, oh, there might be a bit more data coming from it in due course. Okay then, so just to finish up, I've got uh, one more slide, which uh, is the timetable for submissions. Um, just to, to talk through this, so the, the webinars at the top there, I suppose those are running. Um, the, the date for submitting, that's 5 p.m. on the 24th of July. Uh, I've mentioned that we'll have the panel to screen the logic models in August, uh, and then from September onwards we move into those of you who are required to do so, but the cost-benefit analysis. Um, that will lead then to, to draft operational plans on the 30th of October. Um, those will then um, be subjected to peer review. So I think Jim knows the exact details of this, but as I understand it, you'll be matched up with areas who are, are working on a similar theme to you in terms of their RPS proposal, and that's a chance to, to learn about other areas' ideas, to put some constructive criticism and challenge to them, to further improve your proposals. And then in early February, after you've had your support from relationship managers, You've had the chance for one-to-one -one discussions with the new economy team and with others. Um, the submission of the final operational plans in, in mid-February so that they can be signed off and good to go from the start of April. So that is the time to have you working through. Um, Jim and, and the core locality team can give you uh, more advice on that if you need it. Um, just finally from me, um, oops, back on, I'm sorry. Um, any final questions, Gareth, that I need to answer? Uh, yes, there's, there's a few questions. First of all, uh, do we need to quantify outcomes? For example, saying, uh, you know, metric of 80% uh, of people get into sustained employment, or can, can the uh, area just mention sustained employment as an outcome? I think for, for now, I suggest uh, just mentioning it as an outcome. Um, it's very difficult to forecast what level of impact, what level of performance you're going to have against different outcomes, um, especially if you're proposing a completely new way of delivering services. It would be unreasonable of us to expect, okay, exactly how many percent are you going to improve uh, the employment rate of your clients, or uh, what percentage of your clients are not going to be obese or overweight thanks to interventions. Um, so just in those instances, just tell us what the, the outcome is, and then as we'll see in the autumn when we actually do the modelling, that's when we can start to play around with, with how effective we think you're, you're going to be, and um, then we can understand what that means in financial benefit terms. So just cite what the outcome is, but not necessarily the, the percentage improvement in that outcome. Okay, and uh, how do you find out about the monetary value of volunteer time in your particular area, in your region? Okay, so the, um, 
Volunteer England, I think it is, which is the national sort of oversight body for volunteering. And their approach is, um, I'm a bit out of touch with something. I think it's based on the local average wage. Um, so it's assuming that a volunteer is an average skilled person who is doing an average job within the, the local economy. And most of our place areas, some of you might have heard presentations from Bradford groups and others, they use, it's about, about £11 an hour, 10 to £11 an hour is the number that you most often see cited. So that idea that those volunteers, if they were working in an office or a shop or a restaurant or wherever it would be, you know, could be earning a, a, a standard average wage because they've got those kind of skills. Um, I have seen some proposals where people have said actually our volunteers are the very highly skilled business people providing mentoring or whatever it might be to other business startups. So we've quantified that volunteering time at £25 an hour or something like that. Um, so long as um, you set out uh, the justification for whatever value you use, it doesn't matter. Um, the key thing is that you do have a, a cost per hour of volunteering time and you don't just say it's a freebie, therefore we don't need to count it. Okay, thank you. Um, and there's just one final uh, question or comment, really, and I think I'm probably the best person to answer this. I've had a question, as time is pressing, when might we meet our relationship manager, please? Okay, I, I, all the relationship managers were appointed last Thursday, and towards the end of the day, I sent an email out to all of those name lead names on each of the Our Place Area programs. So it's the lead officer who applied for the... Um, grant which the email would have gone explaining that your relationship manager should be in touch within the next few days. All the relationship managers have been requested to confirm whether or not they can uh, take on the re relationship manager role. That's they, They've been asked to do that by today. I think there's probably one or two relationship managers who are yet to confirm. So, uh, uh, And they will be getting in touch with you very shortly. Um, just be, just to uh, touch base with you and organise the first meeting. I understand that some of you haven't uh, heard from Groundwork with regards to due diligence and uh, we haven't sent the contract out for uh, the formal offer of uh, two relationship managers, but that shouldn't prevent them from getting in touch with you. Um, if you have any more questions about relationship managers or if you're not the named person on your, your uh, application, which the email would have gone to, please email me at ourplace at locality.org.uk. Okay. So thank you, Sarah, for that. Thank you, David. I think that Yeah. I think that's it. Think so okay, just well, good luck to everybody in completing their logic models. I hope it goes well. And um, trust me, it is it I I think it's quite an enjoyable process. It's not as uh, as boring as dry perhaps it sounds. And it gives you a real chance as a partnership to think about what you're proposing and set it out in a logical way, which should help you in future. Great. Okay. Well, uh, there's a lot of thanks coming in, David, and thank you so much for uh, your presentation. The um, and thank you all for joining this morning's webinar. I hope you find it useful and interesting. Uh, we've got some more webinars coming up on the topic of community enterprise, and we're just working out with partners to finalise some dates. Uh, if you'd like to be the first to know when those dates have been confirmed, you can sign up to our email newsletter to receive that information. Uh, just visit locality.org.uk forward slash subscribe. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we will be sending out the slides to you in the next couple of days. And any questions that we didn't get answered today will be passed to our advice team who will get in touch with you. Although I think we did manage to answer every single question. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And I hope to see you all uh, very shortly. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.